Good morning, good morning. Thank you. It is a good morning. A beautiful morning. So we've been talking about gifts, uh, and uh, I've enjoyed it so far. And um, I'm going to be speaking on servants with gifts today. And um, I'm going to start out in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 22. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 22 and 23. Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit, in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, through the word of God which lives and abides forever. So when I looked at this scripture about purifying your soul through the truth, through the Spirit, and sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently and uh, and with a pure heart. And I start thinking about that. Really, love at its core is giving. How many know that? It's, it's you lay down your life for somebody else uh, to be blessed, taken care of. Um, you know, moms are some of the greatest examples. When they have a baby, they basically lay down their life for a year straight. I mean, more than that. But, <laughs> but the first year is a total laying down of your life. You feel like your life disappeared and um, you, you know, became this servant to your child. And um, so I love how it says here about that, uh, of this fervent love. And, and I think before you, as you learn to serve people and to bless people, first of all, you got to learn to love them. You, you got to learn to love people in general, uh, to actually become uh, a real servant. Because otherwise, you know, our motives get kind of screwy. I mean, know that. It, you, you can be doing it for yourself. You can be doing it for, uh, you know, a, a, the wrong motive, all that kind of thing. But love always has this beautiful, uh, uh, you know, part of it. And so um, I want to actually... Um, Jump to uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, and um, we're going to look at uh, verse 1 through 5 first. It says, um, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and evil, all evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the sincere uh, milk of the word, that you may grow by, thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Here, here's one of the things, is... You got to spend time with God, because out of everything, you have to taste that the Lord is good and that He is gracious. To be a servant of God, because when you're a servant, how many times? Sometimes servants get ran over, get criticized, get hurt for all kinds of reasons, and and that kind of thing. And t people don't always treat you well. So if you haven't tasted God is good and actually understand how, how good he is, how precious he is, and spend time in his presence to absorb his love, it's going to be very difficult to, to, to continue serving because here's the thing, is throughout any type of ministry, I don't care if you're at work, you're a parent, whatever, you 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 experience a million different things, and a, a lot of them are not good. Isn't that true in life? Have you found that? I mean, sometimes your intentions are great, and people don't understand your intentions, and, you know, uh, and then you hear all kinds of stuff uh, about you that wasn't true. And so we have to, to understand uh, some things there. I'm going to look at verse 9 and 10. It says there that um, you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him 
who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who have not obtained, uh, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. So then in verse 11, he goes on and says, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly loves, lusts, which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak evil against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. So what's happening is people are going to think all kinds of stuff. But here's the deal. When, when you're doing something out of a pure motive and your heart is right, they're going to observe your good works that they cannot deny. You know, it's interesting because, you know, in, in, I always, wherever I've worked at, I'm on assignment, right? I'm on assignment there to bring the kingdom of God into that place. And so, you know, people ask me stuff all the time, and I help people all the time. And, and I was talk, talking to one guy, and I was talking about how forgiveness is so important as a Christian. And, and he told me, he said, you know, he said, I got shocked years ago, and um, my wife left me and divorced me. And it was a total shock. And so I started talking to him about forgiveness. And, you know, he's been a believer for a lot of years, but have never put into practice forgiveness. When I say put into practice, as a servant, you got to put into practice forgiveness. And, and learning the steps of Scripture and that kind of thing. You know, I like to say in our life, God is the big plan for us, okay? So God created us um, in the womb, and, and, and he created us with all kinds of things and talents and gifts and uh, anointings and things. And then Jesus came along, and Jesus is grace. How many know grace is the power of God, it's the force of God, the energy of God to do something and expand it? So I'll give you a good example. So, if one of the gifts is giving in the New Testament. So, here's what happens is, is, is God created you to be a giver. Created it in your very nature. What do you think the devil's going to do if God created something that's supposed to be part of your life? Attack it. Right? Attack it. So, you start giving... If people don't care, they take advantage of you, they call you up to give, them more, give you more money, all kinds of stuff, right, in your life. And so, so grace is the power of God to actually take what that gift is and expand it. Well, I'll give you an example, okay? So when I was little, um, you could tell right from the get-go that I could catch anything, throw anything, hand-eye coordination, was extremely high, and I love to play sports, all right? I'm in fourth grade, playing sports, out on the playground, and I don't, I, I just lost in that, and my teacher comes out, grabs me by the hair, and drags me back into class. Pretty embarrassing, right? For just doing something that I absolutely loved, I'm just, I'm, a, a, don't even think about it. I should be back inside with all the classroom. All the teacher had to do was come, hey, Tim, you know, recess is over. Come back in. So I got a negative experience, right, on part of a gift that was in me that, that could have really hurt my life. And, and, you know, I was just out there playing. And so I, I, I started thinking about all the people in my life that helped me. How many know you need help? even if you have a gift. You, you need trained. You, you, how do you dribble the ball? How do you shoot a ball? How do you catch a ball? How do you go down properly and, and throw it without hurting your arm and with, you know, all these different things and training uh, processes, you know? And, and, so, um, and, and so what happens is grace, it's like I'm going to go back to giving. Grace, okay, so you give 10 bucks to somebody, God his grace multiplies it to 50. You went, where'd that happen? Because that's what grace does. He takes your gift, expands your gift, and makes it even greater. 
But see, if you never practice it, if you never start giving, even though you have a giving grace for right from God, it's part of your DNA. It's part of it, but your mind says, you know, people don't appreciate it. They don't care about it, that kind of thing. They, 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 all of a sudden, you will shut down your grace by the way you think. And so, you know, in that situation, um, I just kept playing ball, and I, I didn't let that shut me down. And I played through a ball uh, throughout my time period. And one of my um, coaches actually built a basketball court in his backyard. So every day we were there playing. He had lights up. He had a basketball court. We would even shovel it off in the winter time to play basketball. I know that sounds stupid, you know, but we would. And we would play and we got better and better. Why? What happens is the more you practice your grace and you work on it, the more God keeps adding to you, whether it's a physical trait or a spiritual trait or whatever it is, God keeps adding to it. And then the Holy Spirit gets involved and he gets real creative for you. And he said, you remember when you gave this? And like the Holy Spirit will say things like this, okay? So we're in Boyne City, love Boyne City, just adore Boyne City, do youth ministry, had a ball, um, you know, the whole time. And we had a couple kids that were getting ready to go to Bible college, and the Holy Spirit spoke to us and said, sell your vehicle um, and give it to them for their start of school. And I don't remember, it wasn't like a super expensive, back then, this was years ago, you guys, like, it, it, it was, a, yeah, and, and, and uh, I don't know if we sold it for 500 or 1,000. Uh, it was something like that, you know, but this is like also, gosh, 30 years ago. Uh, more than that, maybe 32 years ago. So, you know, 1,000 then is like 8,000 now. <laughs> now our money has changed a little. I mean, know that. So, so, so we plant that seed because God. So then what happens is, is God starts multiplying. The Holy Spirit gets involved in your seed. And all of a sudden, we move here. And somebody paid for our children to go to Christian school for two straight years. Two or three? Two. I think it's two. And the Holy Spirit, I'm like, God. He said, remember the seed you planted to those kids that go to Bible school. I just, plan I just made it so your kids could go to Christian school for free. For two years. You remember that seed? Like, oh, yeah. So that's what happens is, is that's why we have to, to the negative and, you know, taking our mind and renewing it to it, is God wants to multiply our talent. So I remember after all those years, I was playing uh, basketball in, in a men's league, and I was 20, 19 or 20, my old coach came. Now, it was the last game of the season. And wouldn't you know, my own brother, Dave, was competing with me for the championship, scoring championship of the whole league. So that day, that night, I scored 36 points. And I think I went up over him by, I think we were really close, five, six, seven points away. So I'm up by 42. What's he do? Score one more point than I did, and he won the championship by one point. But my coach came up to me afterwards, and he said, I can't believe how good you are. You see, he coached me when I was little. See, what happens is, is God takes your little that you'll give to him, whether it's compassion, mercy, Giving, whatever, adds, Jesus adds the grace to it to expand it. And the Holy Spirit starts getting really creative. It starts telling you when to sow, when to give, when to show mercy. What, does that make sense? So, so back to my friend, here's grace. Grace to forgive. Been given by Jesus. Holy Spirit, I mean, in Scripture says, those who despitefully use you, pray for them. How many of your first inclination is somebody just hurt you real bad to pray for them? 
a few of us. Most of the time, we're pretty angry at, at first, right? If you don't have your mind trained to forgive, and then of all things, God said, if, here's the grace, here's what Jesus said. Not only forgive them, bless them. You're not going to activate that grace if you don't bless them. I'm sorry, you're just going to sit there angry and frustrated for however long you do it, maybe the rest of your life. But the grace is there. Jesus is there. So if you don't activate that, that gift of forgiveness that he gave us and then give it away to somebody and then do what Jesus said, bless them, pray for them who despitefully use you, and do good to them. How, how many, the person who hurt you the worst in your life, could you go up today and give, bake them a pie and give it to them and wrap your arms around them? That's what you call mature grace. Does God love you if you don't forgive him? Sure he does. D does he care about your life? Sure he does. But guess what? Whatever you give away, you get back. You give away forgiveness, you get back forgiveness. How many, how many have done stupid things in your life and need forgiven? Guess what? A lot of those people aren't going to forgive us if we don't, if we don't activate grace. It, it's just an activation of what has God did for you because I'm forgiven, Scripture says, I can forgive. What is it? When I've totally received that I'm forgiven, past, present, future, that God doesn't hold my sins anymore, doesn't count them against me anymore, when I totally receive that, all of a sudden I can give way. You don't deserve my forgiveness. She hurt me really bad. You don't deserve it. But when you receive something and you never did deserve it, all of a sudden that grace to give it to somebody else is there. That makes sense? So to activate gifts is so um, really, really important. So, you know, I, I, I won't have time to cover a lot of this because i got some stuff. But, you know, when Scripture says that you're a new creation in Christ in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 through 19, it says, If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. In that section of Scripture, he says that all died... If, if Christ died for us, all of us died. That means we, okay, to act, okay, what does that mean? Christ died for us. How many know that there's a lot of things about dying daily? That means if, if Chris hurt me, I have to realize that Christ died for me. He died for my sins. He died for everything I did. So therefore, if I'm going to die I'm going to forgive her. I'm going to activate the life that Jesus did. I'm going to lay down my life because of this and receive what Jesus did, and now there's grace for it. But most Christians, and, and, and I'm not putting down my friend because I'm teaching him, because most people don't teach you that you can live your whole life as a Christian and never activate what God purchased at the cross. Oh, just because of his mercy, he'll, he'll, he'll bless you with things because he's trying to get you on the path. He will. God will just try, continue to try to get you on the path. The Holy Spirit will continue to talk to you. But, so in that new creation um, scripture, it says, all died that we should live for him and not count in sins. In Mark 9, 41, it says, this, this kind of blows my mind. If, if, if I give you, if this was water, a cup of cold water in the name of Christ, I never lose my reward, ever. A simple little glass of water. What I do, I just activated a giving grace. I just activated it. And that means God just keeps multiplying it, and, and I'll never lose that reward. 
See, we have to learn to increase what God has given us. It's increase. You know, when I read scripture, it's interesting to me, like the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6. Give us this day our daily bread. You know, I can't pray that without praying for somebody else. So, if I'm in a room and we're all praying, give us this day. So, because it says us, I never pray that for myself alone. Why? Because I want to fall in love with you, and you, and you, and you. I want to fall in love with you, and I want to believe that God would give you your daily bread. Forgive us our debts. God, you've helped me to learn to be a forgiver. Please help all my family, my friends, my church family to be forgivers. Forgive us, Father. Lead us not into temptation. You know, how many of us sometimes just go, well, they're stupid. They just got into that. Okay, I get it. But, but don't we want to activate grace in their life? If I want to activate grace, say, in my son's life, I say, Father, help me and my son to forgive everybody, to walk in this incredible forgiveness of what you gave to me as a grace gift. See, Scripture is so full of this. It's, it's, not, it's not about an individual relationship. It's really about a corporate relationship, us having an individual one in, inside of that, but it's really corporate. And that's why the body of Christ can't accomplish much if people don't fall in love with each other and bless each other and pray for each other, and believe the best in each other. If we're going to activate gifts that are going to be powerful. I want to read this scripture about John chapter 13. If you'll go to that. John chapter 13, and we'll start at verse 1. Now this is almost the end of Jesus' ministry. And the end of verse 1 says he loved them to the end. Okay? He loved them to the end. What did he do right near the end of his life? He said, of course, the devil had put in the heart of Judas to betray him. But Jesus, in verse 3, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand, that he had come from God, and was going to God, rose from supper, laid aside his garments, took a towel, girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet. Why is that important? Why did Jesus do this right at the end of his life? Your feet in Scripture are supposed to be shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. But how many in life, in life, in their time period, their feet got extremely dirty? Your feet are your lifestyle, where you walk, what you do in life, right? That's your feet. It's supposed to be shed, shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Peace means nothing missing, nothing broken, blessings, and, and in your life, right? That's what peace means, shalom in the Hebrew. So, so, so here he is washing their feet, and Simon Peter, you're not going to wash my feet. And he says, I don't wash your feet. You're not part of me. With, see, if I don't wash Pastor Darren's feet, I'll never really become a part of him. I can like him. There's something about becoming a part, being a member of a body. So when I wash his feet, I have to get down on my knees and humble myself. 
I don't know if you've ever been in a foot washing service before. I have been, quite a few. We used to do this in our church. It's the most humbling thing for the person getting their feet washed. It's incredible. They're, they're like, no, you almost feel like, no, you shouldn't wash my feet. But Jesus said to do that. He said, I'm doing, I'm showing you something that's very important. He began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel with which he was girded. Go ahead and change that next verse. Then he came to Simon Peter. Peter said, Lord, are you washing my feet? Next verse. Jesus answered and said, what I'm doing you do not understand now, but you'll know after this. You're going to know that the greatest in the kingdom is the servant of all. One of the things Jesus dealt with at the end was they wanted to set and be the most high and mighty ones. Like, I want to sit next to you on the throne, Jesus. He's like, uh, you want to do that? First of all, you're not, you can't do that. That's appointed for somebody else. But if you want to do that, then become the servant of all. See, the Christian walk is really a life of laying down our life for each other. I want to read something to you that I wrote down. about the body of Christ and why we need each other. Um, nothing stands alone. We are all intrinsically like the Trinity, living in absolute relatedness we call this love. See, the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit is this beautiful dance of love. That's what it is. It, it, the Father has this beautiful plan. Jesus carried it out at the cross, and then the Holy Spirit just manifests everything that Jesus did. And, and, and so it's this beautiful plan that God had from the beginning of time. The very nature of our lifestyle and our, our church teaching must say, from the beginning, the goal is the communion of saints, a shared life together, sharing the life of God and enjoying the kingdom right here. Some think, people think the kingdom of God is someday when we're all in heaven, which, by the way, you're only in heaven temporarily because the Scripture says the righteous inherit the earth, not heaven. The righteous inherit the earth. So when you think about... I, I wrote down, whether it's our parents, our teachers, our mentors, our friends, our church, our neighbors, people have been pouring into us. We are standing on a foundation. Our job is to build on what we've been given. See, my life is a, is, is a total thing of the, the hurts, the pains, the successes, the struggle, the never give up. The, right? Yeah. Knowing that I could, I could really screw up something and it costs me. But also knowing I have the help of God in a situation. I, I have the helper of the Holy Spirit that helps me and helps, can totally change the situation. And so activating grace is so important. Activating your gifts is so important. And being so thankful. Can you be thankful for people who hurt you? The answer is yes. You can be. Why? Because all of a sudden when you activated grace, you saw the power of God was greater than the power of man. When I had that dream of building our church, and I saw all kinds of, I saw new people in leadership. I saw myself with my shoes on backwards right here. Where's Jeff Sutton? My shoes on backwards, which I knew what that meant because the gospel is your shoes. And 
I was going to understand God a little different than I was raised. And when I saw that and I saw our children's ministry, it was like a bow. And I saw a guy come in the back that opened the door who had really treated my wife horrible and um, didn't like us. And, and certainly, he kind of liked me, but he definitely didn't like Cindy. And I mean, he treated us bad. I saw him walk through the door, right door exactly like that. And I knew that I had changed from this um, person who wanted somebody to be hurt because of hurting you, that you didn't want the best for them, to somebody who had been changed because of grace. Because of activating grace, I ran to this guy and greeted him at the door and wept and put my arms around him. You can stay different if you want. But if you want to activate grace in your life and activate what Jesus did and activate the gift of forgiveness, it is a gift. It is something that he gave us this free gift. And now we can get the chance to multiply it with each other. It's taking our gifts. Otherwise, you know, bitterness can ruin your life. It really can. Have you ever learned to just sit at home and sit in God's presence? And know how loved you are? That allows you to pass that gift of grace on to somebody else. How often do we see another person as a beautiful gift? How often do we look at somebody and say, thank you for the gift you are to me. I love your smile. You're so beautiful. I'm so thankful you're my granddaughter. I can't wait to see all the beautiful things you do. See, when you learn to receive it from Papa, we can learn to receive it from each other and give it to each other. And, and really, that's what gifts are for. Gifts are to give away. To enjoy, yes, but also to give away. Do we ever take a moment... Maybe this is a good Valentine's one. You ever take a moment where our eyes meet and you hold each other's gaze for a few breaths? And the act of seeing each other with love? Okay. You got somebody next to you, right? Look them in the eye. If some of you don't, but I'll look in your eye, too, Bob. I'll look in her eye, too, at the same time, okay? I got one eye there, one eye here. <laughs> you look at Chris. I'll look at Bob. Somebody will look at somebody. And, and, and I want you to picture how loved they are by God. And God, how can I love them like you do? And see the gifts in them. This guy is an incredible giver and so thirsty for God. This is who he is. He's always been that way. And I'm so thankful for you being in my life, Bob. Because you, you, you inspire me with your worship. You inspire me with your giving, with your heart, and with your intensity to learn. I love that. I'm thankful for you. Do that with somebody right now, would you please, instead of just listening to me? That was my private thing, right? That was my private thing with Bob. Although it wasn't private, it was public.
once you're done, I'm going to end on this scripture. In 1 Corinthians 14, verse 1. Caden, if you can go to that. 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 1. Pursue love. How many remember before you were married, if you're married, or even if your husband or wife are not with you now, but how do you remember when you were, fell in love? How did you pursue her? This is my story with Cindy, Pastor Cindy. So I was in Lansing, three and a half hours away from Boyne City. I came up every week, every week. You should read our letters, my letters, to her. She wrote back, <laughs> but I'm talking about me. <laughs> so, so here's the thing. When I look back on them, they're like, honey, I love you. Babe, you're so sweet. Babe, I can't wait till we're married. Babe, I just miss you so much, babe. It was babe every other line. It was. But, but I pursued her. I pursued her. You got to pursue love with God, with each other, with our family, and desire spiritual gifts. To, to desire some, how many like sometimes just, I just desire a pizza right now? And you go out of, out of your way, man, even if you don't hardly have enough money to get it, you go and buy it, right? And you bring it home and you eat it, right? You, you got to sometimes, you, you, not only if you're going to desire it, you got to use it. If you're going to desire, God said desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. Next verse. For he who speaks in tongues does not speak to men, but to God. For no one understands him. How about being in the spirit? He speaks mysteries. Verse 3. But he who prophesies speaks edification, exhortation, and comfort to men. How many like to be edified? That means to be built up. Exhorted, you can do this, man. Go! How about a good coach, you know? A good coach actually does win games. Believe it or not, he inspires his play players to actually tap a different level, I'd say of grace in a church realm, but a different uh, level to actually win that game against a team that may be actually better than them. But to exhort somebody and to also bring comfort. So, my last thing to do, we got two minutes left. I want you to turn to somebody, and I want you to edify them, exhort them, and comfort, and let the Holy Spirit speak through you. Okay, I know, it's like, it's like participation class today, right? So, I want you to prophesy over them, which is just, Edification. All right, last thing. <laughs> Stand up and go to somebody who you weren't really close to and just bless them. And I bless us today. And I say, let's come back for the Super Bowl party and have a wonderful day. Bring some snacks and hug somebody and bless them before we go. Amen.